Hi everybody, I hope you can hear and see me. Um, my name is Joss Boys. I'm the course director for the MSc Learning Environment um, and I'm going to talk for about half an hour about that course and also about the current situation, the pandemic and how important thinking about learning environments in that context is. Whilst I'm talking, it would be really great if you uh, asked any questions through the quick Q&A button and if you want, it would also be really cool if you put some details in about why you're interested in the course, what your background is, anything that you want to share, feel able to share in this context. I'll uh, deal with questions when we get um, to the end of my talk. So I'm going to share my screen with you now. So, um, I want to talk about studying the MSc learning environments and for me that's about this bigger issue of how we address contemporary problems to create positive educational, social and sustainable outcomes. We are uh, really interested in developing individual specialisms, starting from what you already know, but then bringing a real understanding of the whole range of connections with um, learning to that background. But we're also really interested in what that means in terms of improving further uh, educational futures. So what does it mean to study learning environments at a master's level? Basically, we're thinking about how you develop, how you design, how you manage, how you use learning environments. And that this is a really complex and dynamic set of interrelationships. It brings together policy, economics, real estate, architecture, uh, with all, a whole range of educational perspectives and agendas from across policy right through to individual learners and from across learners in kindergarten right through to learners in future, in, in uh, lifelong learning, in later life, for example. So that in itself involves a whole range of key global and local challenges and it requires, we really need more of these kind of dis cross-disciplinary expertise and skills. We don't have enough. Uh, of people who can work in this field with that kind of range of, of knowledge. And then particularly in the current moment with the pandemic, thinking about how education can be organised in physical spaces, in virtual spaces, in some sort of blended mix of those spaces, it's becoming vitally important. It, it has the potential to make a real shift towards uh, what learning is like um, in the next uh, 10, 10, 20 years. So this is not just about the short term changes that are happening now where digital learning is inherently having to replace face to face um, and where physical settings are being altered very immediately based on trying to enable social distance. It's also an opportunity to think deeply about what the learning process is at different levels, different sectors, in different locations and how we can improve that. So I want to just do a little bit of background because um, there are some really key issues in thinking about learning and thinking about where developments are likely to happen. So what we have to start is growing numbers being educated globally. The uh, global population has increased 
considerably. And um, at the same time, the kind of possibilities for uh, learning are changing country by country. So you can see from the graph here that um, the numbers studying at a primary level has really increased, that the amount of primary education in countries across the world, obviously there are some countries that don't uh, supply data of this sort, but that generally that's really expanding and secondary education is coming along behind it. So the amount of work that's going on is um, wide ranging. The quality is uh, something that then we need to have some concern about. And then tertiary education, university education, uh, also expanding, but more slowly. Um, and if we look at that, we can see that uh, that still means there are considerable problems uh, to be solved. And these are, some of you may well know, the UN sustainable uh, sustainability goals. So number four is, uh, inclusive and equitable quality education and again we have some figures about where education is not meeting the needs of the next generation of uh, school children and that uh, levels of literacy um, levels of uh, equality and access to education are still very variable across the world and education of course is a real route into increased equality uh, reduction of poverty so it's a really vital element of uh, people's development. At the same time as we have that kind of global picture, we have a real sense that the shape of education is itself changing. This is particularly in the global north, the west, but it's something that's happening more generally. And to put it in a very stereotyped way, that's a move from the notion of um, a kind of formal talk in a big lecture theatre or a classroom where children are just lined up in rows to an idea that it's much more informal, it's interactive, students are working with each other as much as they're working with the teacher, and that they're learning from each other through collaborative engagement. They're not just being told knowledge which they have to repeat. And those kind of moves have implications for the educational state of all sorts. And that's at every level. Uh, this, as you can see, is a kindergarten, so we have these spaces which are flexible. They offer a variety of kinds of spaces where children can learn. You'll see very similar environments to this now in primary schools uh, that are welcoming, that use color, that use variety to uh, make the experience of learning uh, a rich one, a rich one and enjoyable one. We also have a kind of move towards not just big lecture theatres, but different ways in which larger groups of people can meet together quite informally. This is actually from a um, primary school in Melbourne in um, Australia, where this stair, the Hellerup stair, enables um, assemblies to happen actually what is in the main hallway of the building. Uh, and it also becomes a kind of import, informal meeting and stopping place for all sorts of people at other times. So it has a multi-purpose. That idea that I showed of a kind of collaborative uh, engagement, so students working with each other in groups and developing their knowledge both together and individually, you begin to get in, um, in universities, for example, you get libraries that have these very relaxed spaces for students to work together, but you also have variations of this in secondary schools and primary schools. Um, and you get a whole kind of new set of environments, really, that allow learners to work in different ways, depending on what they prefer to do and how they prefer to do it. Um, the best ones are what I would call multimodal. They enable students to use um, not just essay writing, but also making videos, making uh, podcasts as a way of developing their knowledge and demonstrating what they've learned. That's underpinned, of course, by these big technological changes and by uh, technology rich spaces. Here's one which is experiential. So there's a lot of interest in doing, in making, in enabling uh, students to learn the kind of skills that are going to be very relevant through the next um, 10, 15 years. And connected to that are specialist shared facilities. This again is in Australia. This is actually outside Melbourne, a place called Bendigo 
and it's a tech school. So it's a shared facility for the whole state of Victoria based at La Trobe University where school children come in, they have access to the range of robotics and AI type of kit that the individual schools could in no way afford and they have the teaching skills to support that, um, they can do coding and so they come as a class uh, for a period of time, maybe for a week, to get really intensive um, understanding of those kind of important uh, next generation knowledge and skills. So all these things are uh, becoming quite commonplace really. They're, they're kind of what's happening everywhere, although again, very unevenly. So if that's a kind of background about what's happening against that background, what are the things that we focus on um, and should be focusing on in terms of thinking about learning environments? And I'm gonna talk about four because I think these are the four that we do focus on. One is technological change and innovation. A lot of the disruptive shifts in education have been as new technologies, as computer-aided instruction, and then the internet, and then a whole range of different devices, and now new kinds of online spaces have shifted where you can learn and how you can learn, and produced all sorts of competitors to the kind of standard school or the standard university course. We are really uh, concerned about sustainability and social equity. How can we make education also sustainable? What can we do to support um, the education of the state to be sustainable, not just in uh, the technologies that it uses and the amount of waste or the amount of energy that it uses, but in a more uh, long-term strategy about sharing resources, about um, managing learning resource, uh, learning research and educational uh, teaching activities in ways that are deeply sustainable and um, energy resource effective. At the same time, we've got new business models developing all the time. We've got uh, new startups trying to uh, find alternative ways to operate in education. And we are still not very good at, but need to better leverage. We need to better make use of the scarce resource that educational buildings are. They have facilities often which could be shared in a community or could be shared in a different way, in a community of interest, for example, which still doesn't happen in most places most of the time. So what sorts of things does that mean? Uh, well, of course it means what we're doing now. It means distance learning. It means how do we um, make distance learning an enjoyable, engaging, but also effective way of teaching and learning. Um, there's a whole lot of work in uh, 3D virtual environments around that. This is an educational space um, in Second Life. Uh, I was involved in some of these, trying out some of these kind of projects actually back in the early uh, uh, 2000s. But uh, there, with Web3, there's a kind of renewed interest in uh, what a 3D virtual space might be like and how it might be organized very differently. And we'll see what happens there. We also have many more kind of digital interfaces and systems just becoming part of everybody's everyday experience. This is from um, a, a library in Birmingham in England, uh, where there's just a whole number of interactive screens that um, people coming into the library can make use of in all sorts of ways. We also have real shifts towards coding being something that you might learn even at primary school level, the effects of AI, artificial intelligence at all sorts of levels from learning analytics through to um, personalized uh, content and of course robotics including remote robotics so the possibility of being, being in another country and using the robotic equipment that UCL has, which is already very commonplace. And then of course, there's immersive learning, a real interest as VR and these kinds of um, environments and the software and hardware that supports them develops, they're becoming something that could be really used in a, um, a much more ubiquitous way than currently. There's also a real interest in sustainable and intelligent buildings. This is a project in the Philippines which tries to use uh, natural ventilation as part of the way that it operates. Uh, and at the same time as buildings like that are becoming more open, um, 
many schools in many countries tend to be still very enclosed and locked behind gates. So uh, part of our interest is how we might think about the facilities that are in schools and what are the things that are stopping them being used more widely uh, at other at times of the day when they're not being used by a school, for example. We've also been working quite a lot. This is, um, uh, this is local. We are, case studies that we work with tend to be both quite local in that they're just visitable immediately uh, from the campus, from the UCL here East campus, and then international, so that we would anyway be talking to these people through a boat connection. The, uh, this is the London Screen Academy. So we're working with architecture initiative, uh, uh, an architecture practice that do a lot of procurement and development of different sorts of projects, which do try and exploit the facilities, not just for the use of that particular educational concern, but for more uh, public community use and look at how that can be managed, how it can be financed, how it can be designed in. There are also uh, uh, changes happening on the scene. Um, this is a group called Changemaker Schools, which you may have heard of, who are working internationally. Schools join up to this policy and then are supported in a whole series of uh, development areas to enable them to improve the way that they teach. So there are these bigger, more strategic uh, movements, um, both nationally and internationally that are very interesting right now. And there are, I mentioned already, there are quite a lot of uh, alternative startups that are finding ways in to education that don't necessarily uh, still use the same processes of validation of standard undergra undergraduate or postgraduate courses. This is the Singularity University in the States. They've been through many changes, but their argument has always been that you don't need to study for a degree. What you need to do is study with a range of people from very different disciplines and develop in quite intensive uh, groups um, new kinds of projects and new kinds of solutions and expand that in all sorts of ways to uh, make um, a formidable business, not necessarily a competitor with mainstream universities, which I think they originally planned, but certainly a uh, strong um, uh, rethinking of what education at a university level might be like. So I think it's impossible to talk about learning environments right now without thinking about the pandemic. You may all be in quite different situations around that and, and how it's affecting you. Obviously in the UK, uh, we're coming out of lockdown, but we still um, are not as uh, clean from, uh, as some other countries. And we're really, uh, it's producing a kind of new educational normal. Some of that in the short term, some of it longer term. So the short term is this enforced shift to online collect connections. I mean, this event, a webinar I'm doing now is the way that we would always do this. It's just that I'm not sitting at my office. I'm sitting here at home. Luckily, my cat has not decided to interfere, but she often does. Um, so the, uh, that's a shift that we've all been dealing with, or almost all been dealing with, uh, a very interesting shift. And connected to that right now in the immediate situation is what does that mean to places? If we need alternative place-based solutions, what are they like? What does it mean to socially distance in an educational context? How do you organize that? What sorts of numbers are you talking about? This image is uh, a series from a series by architects Curl Latterell Head, who've looked at the possibility of pop-up tents. Is there a way that schools could build in their grounds that they could just erect tents that enable them to have all the children in the school, but much more spread out? So there are a lot of those kind of creative but short-term initiatives that don't necessarily teach us much about what the future of education is going to be. If I think about that, I think it's in a way it's too early to call. It's too early to call for different countries. It's too early to call for different sectors, for different levels of learning. But I think for me, what's really interesting is to watch, having been involved in online learning since before the development of the internet, 
So when it was still done through um, correspondence in the post, Teachers are having to adapt to online learning. They're having to improve their skills in doing that. They're having to do more than just dump their content into um, a learning management system. They're having to think about actually what teaching and learning is about and how they can teach well in this new environment. And I think that that is developing very fast and very well. And it's kind of interesting because having been involved in online teaching and actually being involved in setting up a course in the 90, late 1990s that was one of the first that um, students arrived and got their own laptop with all the content already loaded onto it so because it was free web um, but it's taken us quite a long time to get there again it's very varied across sectors and across places but generally it's taken quite a long time so now we actually have a, a teacher teaching body who know a lot more about how to teach online. And that to me means that educational institutions will think about how they might change their offer and how they might change the long-term balance between online face-to-face -face and a kind of some sort of blended learning variation. So this is a very interesting moment to be in and seeing how that develops. I think the second thing is, I'm not sure will you agree with this, is that as more learners are being forced into online uh, learning, some of them may be having a poor experience, some of them are much better experience, some of them may value the experience. It means that people are becoming much more aware of what's available online and therefore thinking about how they might make use of that, even if that in parallel to their own educational studies. Um, so it's, it's people thinking, beginning to find out and actually doing a kind of six week MOOC or some other kind of course that just improves their skills. And finally, I think the most interesting thing, and it's still early to say, is that it's really increased the competition between different platform suppliers, and that's going to lead to new kinds of online learning spaces. I don't know about your situation, but every day I might use a variation of um, FaceTime, Skype, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Whereby, uh, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, um, and today, this morning, I was doing an online seminar with a um, uh, university in Germany, which is, uses their own in-house system called Big Blue Button. So there are all these different competitors in the field uh, trying to improve their offer and trying to become a kind of leader and the kind of standard um, supplier. So I think that's going to be very interesting. And some of that is a creative disruption that may lead to some real improvements in what those online spaces are. and they will better meet the kinds of things that we need to do if there's, a, if there's large numbers of us learning together but remotely but in a connected way but separated. I think also there are things that are happening in terms of um, the shifting spatial relationships across homework and education. Um, I can no longer separate uh, my home life from my work life easily um, and education gets mixed up in that. I, my daughter's grown up so I don't have small children but people are also homeschooling. The complications and the variety in how people are managing those situations but also in what we might learn from it about how to arrange those things differently I think is really interesting and I certainly know that um, the assumption that I do a lot of public speaking internationally uh, by going to places is now disrupted that it's actually so uh, easy and so much more sustainable to do that from where I live that I think that will be a change certainly in my um, life. In terms of the current educational state I think that things are very unclear. I think we still don't know everybody's working just to deal with the current issue around social distancing, but I don't think that's the longer term issue. I think the longer term issue is about how the interplay between online learning and the physical spaces in which we study and the interplay between where we live, where we work, where we play, where we learn, uh, as those maybe change, then that's the thing that's going to have consequences for um, the learning environments that we have and the learning environments we might have in the future. So 
I wanted to finish by talking a little bit about the course itself and what it does um, and uh, to think about how that could help us uh, engage together with these questions and develop an understanding of them, particularly through, for example, the dissertation writing element. The NSC learning environments is uh, made up of eight taught models and then a dissertation, which is a larger module, self-directed but tutored, um, individually tutored. Of those eight modules, four are shared with the MSC and healthcare facilities because they're more general. They're a kind of setting the scene around real estate, around financial management, around how uh, land and property, how those kinds of assets are developed and how they might be developed differently. So those are called development and capital projects, building solutions and systems, modern economics and finance for real estate giving you a um, really strong grounding in each of those subjects, and then forms of value for real estate, which I guess is the one that's really looking at how we might reinterpret value and how having an idea of value that goes beyond just a commercial cost benefit notion of real estate is part of what enables us to rethink um, not just learning environments, but the management and the uh, development of the built environment more generally. For us within the learning environments, there are four modules. They're led by myself, by Professor Alexi Marmot. We're supported by um, a research fellow from the Institute of Education and by a large number of uh, quite well-known guest speakers um, and other experts who can um, help us deal with these and explore these, co-explore these issues. So effective learning environment sets the scene. It talks uh, uh, Alexi, it leads on that and works through the different ways, the different kinds of learning environments that we have and the kinds of criteria we might use, kind of performance metrics, but also more uh, wider kind of ethnographic and other uh, methods we might use to really understand what counts as uh, effective, what is effective learning. Um, so beyond what is efficient, but also what is effective. Uh, I run towards sustainable learning environments. Uh, in that module, we look at the UN um, sustainability goals and we work with, last year, I think we'll probably do it again, we work actually with the UCL Estates team on the strategies they use and the particular things that are happening um, across the university to think about sustainability from a strategic right through to a kind of detailed level by using a particular example. Last year, we looked at um, the laboratories, because laboratories are a very small part, there's something like 10% of the total uh, footprint of the university, and they use something like 65% of the energy. So they're uh, managing to change, managing to make um, university laboratories more sustainable is a really key way of uh, reducing the kind of waste that goes on uh, more widely. Then learning environments in the digital world is uh, exactly what it sounds like, what, what is happening as we're moving towards more digital learning, um, and what does that mean for space? What are the spatial implications? So the kinds of things that I've talked about around the pandemic, uh, I actually taught this module completely online because it happened the week that we went into lockdown in this country, so it was quite a good time to be teaching it. Um, because it rose, it, uh, all sorts of questions uh, were raised by it. Um, it looks at what those things are and how the sh what shifts are happening and how we might move them forward. And one of my students, for example, who's now doing his dissertation, is looking at um, educational reform in China in terms of what kinds of digital learning uh, is, how, well, where does digital learning need to go? What is already available? What has happened through the pandemic? And then what sorts of systems would actually support um, learning in a, in a high quality way into the future. Learning environments, learning places in the local context, I've mentioned some of the things that underpin that. It is about the fact that how do we manage this resource that is made by the state in, and not just schools, but also, uh, or, or universities or other kind of educational buildings, but also connected buildings beyond the academy, like uh, museums, galleries, uh, theatres. How do those spaces uh, develop an educational 
aspect and how can that really benefit local communities or wider communities of interest, people who have a share a knowledge of a, an interest in a subject area and what is stopping that happening uh, at a policy level, at, a, uh, at the level of, of kind of bureaucratic detail quite often. As with most masters, then the dissertation enables you to take what it really, what really concerns you out of that, out of what you've learned, and push it forward um, in discussion, uh, in quite a detailed discussion with a tutor, um, both to for your own career development, but also for your own personal development. So, what are our key? What's key about this course? Uh, I mentioned rethinking value. I think that's absolutely central. Uh, there are plenty of real estate courses that basically teach you how to be a, a property manager and um, uh, as a kind of profit uh, generating activity. We're not against profit at all, but we're really interested in how you might have a much more complex understanding of what counts as value, including social value as well as economic value. Being at UCL, uh, but also being uh, part of a team who are uh, well known in the learning environments field, we have access to a huge number of really, um, and being in London too, uh, a, a really, a range of really interesting people working in this area. Um, we did a project with Arab Futures last year. Um, so we were looking at how you actually judge future scenarios, what kinds of procedures you use to make sure that you're not just making things up as you go along. Um, we are multidisciplinary, we believe in being integrative and we believe in collaborative learning. So we really appreciate what people bring to the course. People come from business, they come from economics, they come from education, they come from the construction industry or from architecture. Um, we're really welcoming to those wide range of fields because when people bring their own perspectives and agendas, what you get is a really rich discussion and a really rich opportunity to kind of uh, engage in, to collaboratively engage in projects and develop new kinds of solutions. It is uh, a course that's based on uh, scenarios, on problem-based scenarios and on live projects. So during the week that you're with us on each module, we have an intensive project as part of your studies uh, to engage with and work together towards um, uh, making, making uh, better futures. And learning environments is a specialist knowledge. It's definitely an expanding discipline. It's an area where there's a real gap still in people who can cross those kinds of disciplines and who can offer uh, knowledge and expertise to uh, across the educational sectors that can really help them understand what we're doing and how to do it better. Just to finish on how the course is taught, um, I guess we would call it a form of executive education. We teach each module is taught in a one week intensive study block so that you uh, concentrate in, in uh, a very intensive way on uh, issues being discussed. Um, and then in the gaps between there's both uh, work pre-study week uh, reading that you need to do and other activities you need to do and then your assignments obviously come on after the, uh, the week is finished. So between our block weeks you will find that you are doing uh, both uh, background reading and um, developing your own assignments and essays. We offer both a full-time and a flexible part-time route, so full-time one calendar year, part-time uh, we generally hope that people will do it in two calendar years, so four modules in the first um, uh, year and five in the second, but there's a lot of variety on that. Um, you can, if your work situation means that you have to uh, step out for uh, six months, you can do that. So the idea is that you have up to six years to complete. So there's a, the idea is that it takes into account the very different ways in which people um, are engaging with education. There is also a choice of routes. Uh, some people may not want to do a whole master's. You can, do, you can choose to do four modules. So you develop, you get a certificate, 
which enables you just to focus on the things that you need as a form of continuing professional development. You can do eight to a diploma if you don't have the time or the space to concentrate on a dissertation, again, perhaps because of your work situation, or you can do the full MSc. So we want to offer a flexible um, palette that, that matches the things that you need to do uh, in relationship to your own life. So that's really me finished. Um, yes, I hope there's questions in the Q&A. Um, let's see what there is there. And if anybody wants to ask a question uh, verbally, I think you can do that. Um, let me see. I'm assuming you can turn on your mic and do that. And somebody, uh, I think a key question is, what are the professional choices after this course? Um, there are, I think, a lot of opportunities in uh, uh, across the built environment professions, on the one hand, for coming in with those kinds of expertises, expertise, because uh, the educational sector, although it fluctuates, and again, it's different country to country, it's a real growth area in many, low income and developing countries, education is now a really high priority. So there are lots of opportunities, I think, in policy, government departments. Um, uh, there are businesses that are trying to get into education, um, technology businesses, uh, other kinds of businesses that are uh, looking to exploit this area. So to have an understanding of that, I think, offers those opportunities. And then I think there is, um, in the educational sector itself, like within a university, there are people uh, with this kind of expertise, offering consultancy in this kind of expertise. Um, I've worked as a learning environments consultant across universities international, internationally, and there's still a really large demand for those kinds of um, uh, skills and knowledge. Um, somebody's asking about how long will the online class last? Do you mean this one, or do you mean... Um, uh, when we're on the course itself. Um, so for, if I understand you correctly, for all the courses, uh, when we, um, because we teach in these block weeks for each of our modules, so you finish a model in a module in a block week, but you've done uh, preliminary work, some of which may be online, some of which may be in the library, and you've done, uh, you're doing your assignment afterwards. In the week itself, the mixture of face-to-face -face and online is going to vary. And for our first semester, uh, we're still not quite sure what that is. What we're, what we're doing with learning environments is we're designing courses that uh, work really well online if we talk the whole of the week online but we're open to um, depending on how the situation uh, develops here we're open to many different ways of doing that so um, uh, we'll certainly if the opportunity arises we'll certainly be doing one-to-one -one tutorials or small group tutorials as well for people who want face-to-face -face contact I hope that answers that question. If it doesn't, you're welcome to ask some more. No more questions? It doesn't look like it. Cool. Well, if my uh, colleagues are happy for me to finish, then I think that um, we could finish this session. Okay. Lovely. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And I hope that you learn enough. Um, you're very welcome to email me if you want more information. It's j.boys, B-O-Y-S, like boys and girls in English, at ucl.ac.uk. So if you want to have more of a conversation, you can do that. Thanks, everybody. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.